Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. Welcome into the GSMC Basketball Podcast on the GSMC Basketball Podcast Network. I'm your host, Bryce Lewis, and we have another great show for you today on the Basketball Podcast. We're going to start with some Isaiah Thomas talk to start off with a couple of uh, other around the NBA subjects and news. And we're also going to talk some college basketball later on and Christmas Day games at the end. But back to what I was talking about, what we're going to start with. We're going to start with Isaiah Thomas. And Isaiah Thomas was suspended two games by the league for going into the stands confronting a fan. Now, what happened during the situation is, during the game, the, a fan was heckling Isaiah Thomas at the free throw line, saying some very uh, interrogatory things to him. And Isaiah Thomas went into the stands and actually talked to the fan, telling him not to disrespect him. And is basically what you're doing is wrong. So, and that was really it. Isaiah Thomas didn't approach him in any aggressive way. He was calm. If you've seen the video, he wasn't overly aggressive. He did not cuss back. He was just like, hey, don't do that, you know? But the league still went ahead and suspended him two games, which Isaiah Thomas came out on Twitter and was in disagreement with that call. Now, my opinion on this decision is I feel like that Isaiah Thomas shouldn't have been suspended. He didn't do anything crazy. This isn't like the malice in the palace. There was nothing that happened that was just so crazy that he really went against the grain and was like, okay, he did something out of bounds. I feel like the league did it because they felt like we need to make a statement just letting players know don't, don't go into the fans or don't go into the stands and don't interact with the fans in the stands. And I think they just did it to try to set a precedent. But at the same time, I do feel like that it was the wrong president sent because I felt like it wasn't necessarily needed. I do believe that Isaiah Thomas, again, was since he came with such calm intentions that there was no suspension that was needed. And honestly, we've seen this in the past. Russell Westbrook has been a big person in this where he's gotten into with fans, not necessarily walking into the stands, but has directed his, his some of his attention and energy at fans. The incident where a child on the sideline had touched him and he turned around and told the... Uh, the child's parents that, hey, you need to, you need to, you know, make sure that your kid does, you know, stays away from the court and everything. And there has been some debate in the league where there's this question of, you know, fan control. Like, you know, should the NBA do more to control fans? You know, when you go to a sporting event in general, you know, a lot of fans like to drink. And obviously with drinking comes emotions. And then the game is emotional. So then emotions are mixed in with drinking. And then things can happen. Now, when Isaiah Thomas approached the man the, the man said the reason why he did what he did was to get a free frosty yes you heard it a free frosty which is only 99 cents but he, i guess he really didn't want to pay that 99 cents and really it, it's crazy because i think it was one of those things where sometimes teams do this thing where oh if someone misses two free throws you get a free item usually usually a food item and it, it, it's crazy because the i think for Isaiah, when he when he when he heard it, it was just the lengths that a person went to just to get him to miss free throws by calling them out by his name, which you don't do. I do agree, you don't call somebody out by their name. And I think that it's interesting that um, the fan was banned for a year for by the 76ers, so he will not be appearing in any more games for at least the rest of the year. Some people may think that he should have been banned for life. Some people think he should have been maybe banned for two years. It just depends on where you stand on this. I believe that uh, Isaiah Thomas was again in, in. He should have been fine. He shouldn't. He shouldn't have, have been suspended. But again, it goes back to the question of just fan control. Um, I think the NBA is one is the only sport really that allows the fans to be as close as they are to the players. 
you know, football, they have, you know, they're behind the, they're behind the benches, they're behind the end zone, they're behind the field goal. And then they have little, you know, the little walls right there and they have security and just, you know, they're very far from the players. Same thing in baseball. They're behind things. They're far from the players. Soccer, they're behind things. Like you're not as close as you are in basketball. In basketball, you're extremely close. Like if you have money, you can buy a front row ticket literally on the court right next to a player's – right next to the player's uh, bench or the team's bench. And, and, and it's very um, – it's a great experience if you get that close, but it does – create that issue of are fans too close are fans too close to the action do fans need to back up more do fans need to stay away i think that it's a question that can go either way i do think there should be more parameters put in place maybe put maybe like a maybe a little um little stand in front of the fans or one of those things that you put when you're maybe creating a line uh you know just something that that fans can stand behind so they know where the area where they're supposed to go. Because really, when you're that close on the floor, outside of getting up and walking away or walking out of your seat, you really can't move that much closer. And you definitely can't step foot on the actual court because that that can get you automatically kicked out of the game. So I do believe that this is a very interesting, I think, way of handling it. I think, you know, the league needs to really take a look at it and think to themselves, how can we better avoid these situations? Because the only thing about the suspension is it creates the dilemma that they're on the side of the fan, not the player, because you're suspending him for literally just standing up for himself. Because I feel like it's almost like there's this there's this thing with professionalism where you want them to not react to the heckling. In the NBA, you would think a lot of things are said to these players on the court by a lot of different fans. So that's why one of the interviews when they asked Isaiah Thomas about it, they were asking like, "You've told, have you never heard anything worse than this?" Now, when Isaiah answered the question, he was like, "Well, not directed towards me." So for him, this was probably the worst thing, basically, from that statement that was told to him during his years uh, playing basketball, which he's been playing for a very, very long time. And I think that it does create uh, a very interesting dilemma. I think, you know, as, 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 as people, we have to take more responsibility as fans to, to, to not test the player. I feel like it's just one of those things where when an opposing player comes into your home court, you want to affect the game. Fans want to be a part of the game. They want to feel like they have an effect. They want to feel like they have some kind of, of effect upon the outcome. That's why, you know, on free throw lines, they'll be like, oh, make noise because the noise will distract them, have things in the crowd that could distract them. Because if they miss a free, a free throw, the fans are going to feel like they had something to do with that. The fans are going to feel like they played a factor in that in that miss. And I think that's why fans go as far as they do, calling players out by their name and saying very, uh, very uh, derogatory uh, comments, which isn't right, in my opinion. I think as fans, we need to take more responsibility for our actions. And we, in, 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 in any arena that has it, I feel like if an arena, if you hear a fan saying very negative and, and, and very unexcusable things about a player, I feel like you should kick them out right away. I feel like you should ban them right away. I feel like you should handle the situation before maybe if that fan keeps saying those things, it gets to a point where a player might want to retaliate because that's what you don't want. You know what I mean, this is, I mean, one of the darkest days in the league was the Malice in the Palace where Things were said, and then something was thrown at Ron Artest, and then we saw what happened. He went into the crowd beating up fans, and that's considered one of the darkest days in NBA history because that really just – it was not a good look for the league. It hurt the league, and and it's, it's something they want to avoid very badly. So – but I also feel like, you know, it's a fan's responsibility to not allow that to get to that point. It's never that serious. That's one thing we have to understand. This is just a game. It's never that serious. You never have to go that far. You never have to go to those lengths. You know, if you want to miss the free throw, just make some noise, just yell, just scream, just say, go team, whatever. Don't, don't actually try to come for someone. It just makes you realize how quick people are, are quick to shoot off at the mouth almost. Like they're just going to say anything to get you distracted. And it, it, and it's really sad. And I think as a league, they need to come together. 
even like talk to arenas maybe and try to establish maybe some new rules for fans where hey if you act out we will not hesitate to kick you out we won't hesitate to ban you for future events because that's that's what's going to be the 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 standard you know and that way we can avoid situations like this we can avoid suspensions for players because they wanted to defend themselves we can just avoid the entire situation so I feel like the league definitely needs to look into this maybe at some point. You know, CBA is coming up. I don't know if that would be a time you look at it, but because it may not be considered a big issue. But, you know, it's something that definitely needs to be looked at so we can avoid events like this in the future and really just change some uh, different things that fans can do when interacting with players. But uh, coming up next, we're going to talk about some uh, around the league. Uh, Paul George returning to OKC, LeBron missing the game against the Nuggets and, and more coming up. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Last segment, we talked about the Isaiah Thomas situation with the fan. The fan was banned a year. Isaiah Thomas was suspended two games. And what the league needs to do and consider in terms of changing fan interaction rules and how they address situations like this in the future. Now we're going to get into some talk about some around the NBA news, starting with LeBron James being out against the Denver Nuggets. And the Lakers did not look the best without them losing that game, 128-104. Uh, the Nuggets played a very well, good game. Uh, the Lakers, I believe this year, uh, have a losing record when LeBron has not played in a game. Um, which is only won, actually, because I forgot AD didn't play in the other game. LeBron played in. But uh, it, it, this, this, to me, is interesting because... You have to think about this. The Lakers last year when LeBron got hurt did not play very well. They had a losing record. And even though we believe this Lakers team is a better built team, a team that's more better for maybe if a star had to leave for a game or two, you know, this wasn't a good showing. You know, at least you still have a guy that you can go to. Anthony Davis had a good game. But, you know, it's going to be important. You know, when LeBron's nursing his injuries, which I believe is a sore groin, some rib injuries, that they play well without him because you never know if something's going to happen and you need to know that the team can still at least play well without him. It shows the structure of the team. It shows coaching. It shows just how, how, you know, good the team is. I mean, a great example was last year's Toronto Raptors when Kawhi didn't play in a lot of their games. They still had a above 500 record about Kawhi. So you knew they were a good team without Kawhi. Even this year, without Kawhi still proving it, being a top four seed in the Eastern Conference. I think that the the Lakers, this is only one game, so we can't judge too much with this new current team that they have assembled right now. But we do have to think about, hey, if they start losing more games, if LeBron misses more games, could this be, oh, if one AD or LeBron is injured, they can't win without the other player. Because you don't want to make it seem like you're too dependent on your star player to be there to be able to compete and actually be able to play in a game against these guys. I mean, some players played well tonight. I think there's nothing to worry about, though. The Lakers are still a very well-built team. I think the Lakers may need maybe one more shooter, potentially. But overall, I think this is a very built team, very well-built team. I feel like this team has a lot of talent. This team is one of the best teams in the entire NBA. So I don't believe this is anything that we need to extremely worry about and, believe, and think that, oh, if, if someone's not playing, they can't win. Obviously, it's still early in the season, too. So this is around the time you, want, you would want your players like LeBron and AD to take breaks 
to maybe miss some games. This wasn't a low management game because some people were kind of questioning was this low management because LeBron didn't get an MRI. But, it, you know, this would be the time of the season where you kind of just, you know, take your little break and you you get ready for it. Um, plus, you know, they have their Christmas game, game coming up against the L.A. Clippers. So that game's going to be pretty big for them. Big game, obviously, just in general in the NBA season. And, you know, I, you know, the Lakers, like I said, didn't have the best performance tonight without LeBron. But I do believe that they can bounce back from this. And, you know, being there to have his next game, I don't know if LeBron will be back next game. But um, it'll be interesting what happens next game. I think they'll be fine, though, long term, long thinking. I just think, you know, you use a, I mean, LeBron's a very big part of, of the team. You know, it's not like we... We you lose him, you're expected to still be just as good without him. It's just you know how how well do you play without him? Do you still look good without him? Do you still look like you play together without him? Does it still look like you can compete? And that's what I think the Laker fans want to see, and just people in NBA in general want to see that too. Um, in other news, uh, Paul George went back to OKC tonight. Uh, they lost though to the Oklahoma City Thunder. Oklahoma City, gotta give a, gotta, gotta give a shout out to Oklahoma City. A lot of people. When they made that trade, thought this was a complete rebuild. The Thunder were not going to be a good team, probably a lottery team. And Chris Paul's washed up, and just this, this, just basically was supposed to be just a lost season. The Thunder have played some great basketball. They are currently seated in the playoffs right now. They, they really have some pieces. I mean, Dennis Schroeder can play. Dennis Schroeder was a start. It, like Dennis Schroeder is a guy who is a starting point guard in my opinion in this league. So last year when Russell Westbrook was in, you basically just had a backup point guard backing up a star point guard. Now you have a starting point guard still with Chris Paul, who's a starting point guard, but it works better this year because Chris Paul's older, so he can't play as many minutes. But, you know, Trent Shrew can come in there and do it because he had a big straight. He, he played a big uh, part of it down the stretch in uh, the Clippers beating them tonight. And, you know, they have a lot of young talent that they can use and play with and, and really compete with. And I just want to say congratulations to them because, Playing some great basketball right now, but but the, but the big story was Paul George coming back. Paul George had a good game tonight. Um, you know the Clippers. You know it's interesting when I watch them because they really do treat the regular season like it's not really important. Like you can tell in some games that they've played that if there's even a bit of struggle or a bit of breakthrough or if they get down early, they kind of pack it in. They kind of mail it in, just like okay. I feel like for them, they don't care about seeding. They don't care about that. I mean, obviously, you're, you're a good enough team where you're going to have a good record and have good seeding regardless. But you can tell it's not necessarily a priority of theirs. It's not necessarily something that they're aiming for, that they're, 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 that they're going out of their way to try to get. And I think it shows. I think tonight, I'm not saying about tonight, but just in general, um, you know, they have these types of games. Um, you know, it's one of those things where I'm I'm glad though when watching this game that Paul George got a good reception from Oklahoma City because I mean he like I said he did nothing wrong he didn't he didn't diss them he I mean this was just he he made a business decision for himself why well, wanted him Clippers wanted him he was like okay I'll come and they made it happen and, and I mean I mean Paul George I mean remember he was an MVP candidate last year before he had both of his sh- uh, shoulders get hurt and. Even in the playoffs, he still had good numbers, but you could tell Paul Drick wasn't the same player. You know, he's done a lot for the city of Oklahoma City in his, in his, in his two years. And, you know, I think that, you know, he's, he's, he's a guy who, with Kawhi, the Clippers, you know, this is why a lot of people feel like they have a chance to win the championship because they have two of the top two way players in the league. And, you know, I think that it's important that we look at that and we appreciate Paul Drick for everything he's done. Uh, we appreciate Kawhi for what he's done. And we, we don't we don't give disrespect to the greats. Um, like I say, Oklahoma, like I said, congratulations to Oklahoma City because you know they 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 still they played a great game tonight. They beat the Clippers. Like obviously in the seven game series, we're gonna take Clippers every day, but you know it's just good because these are these are important wins for them to build confidence as a team. I mean, you know, you could take you could always take something out of games like this. So you know you know this this is one of those games where it happens. But uh, yeah, so Oklahoma City, you know, got the win tonight um, against the Clippers and. You know, they play a couple, they play a few more times too. So this isn't the last time he'll go back to Oklahoma City one more time later in the year. So it'll, it'll be interesting what happens later. But, uh, just did that, 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 that was a, that was a story tonight. And then lastly, uh, James Harden. James Harden has moved fourth all time in, 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 in 40 point games total 
by an NBA player in their career. He, James Harden, let, let me just say something. James Harden, again, to me, is probably one of the most, in my opinion, disrespected players. Like, again, I understand playoff success is important. But when he played the Suns and was cooking against them, you can't deny this man is one of the best offensive players there is. I mean, he's only behind Kobe, Michael Jordan, and Will Chamberlain for most 40-point games of all times. And I think he'll catch Kobe probably by the way he scores, I'd say maybe next year. Like, that, he, he, he's a big point scorer. And this man, again, is one of the most un, un, unstoppable one-on-one players we've ever seen in this game. And we have to give this man appreciation for everything he's done for this game. He's provided us with highlights, endless highlights, endless endless offensive, beautiful scoring. It's so artistic. It's so just well put together. You can tell James Harden looks at his craft. He wants to be one of the best offensive players to ever set foot on the NBA floor by the way he plays the game. Now, we're going to have to see what happens again this year in the playoffs and what happens in terms of how his game translates to the playoffs, but like right now, got to give appreciation to the greats. James Harden is one of the greats of this generation, of this decade, going into the next decade. And, and James Harden's going to be here for, for a while, a little longer. I believe James Harden probably has a good maybe five years left in him, six years of this type of basketball. You know? Remember, he was a six-man Oklahoma City, and now look where he is today. Almost runner, He won MVP one year and runner-up all the other years. So, you know, James Harden, congrats to him moving up to fourth all time. So it, I, and I look forward to seeing more offensive performances from him and 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 just watching him in general over the next couple of years. But coming up next, we have some more NBA news. The Raptors coming back from historic comeback and also Luka signing with the Jordan brand. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. You're listening to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Sprite Lewis. And last subject, or last segment, we talked about LeBron being out against the Nuggets tonight and how the Lakers looked in a loss. We also talked about Paul George returning to Oklahoma City. And we also talked about how James Harden moved up the court all time in 40 point games. And now we're going to talk about some more news and notes. We're going to start with the wild comeback that happened in Toronto today that was led by Kyle Lowry. Kyle Lowry led one of the best comebacks in NBA history as the Raptors were down 30 with 302 left to go in the in the third quarter and came all the way back to beat the Dallas Mavericks, the Luka-less Dallas Mavericks, uh, in a very tough game, a very uh, wild game. And this is honestly a big game in general for the Raptors. And Kyle Lowry, because Kyle Lowry really hasn't had a game all year that has really stood out. Lowry has honestly kind of been that forgotten point guard in the backcourt with Kyle Van Fleet coming on. And, um, I mean, Fred Van Fleet, my apologies. And how he's kind of almost taken a back seat, even though he is the starting point guard. And this game was just big in general because it was just one of the best games of the NBA season. Uh, this is also the biggest comeback in Raptors history. So that's that's a new record. It's kind of weird with these records like that because it's like, do you really want to break a record for the greatest comeback in your history of your franchise? Because that means you, you really weren't that great early on, which made you have to come back to win the game. But it definitely creates a very emotional game. 
it creates a very high emotional game. And it's one of those games that, you know, you just love to see as an NBA fan. Uh, you know, it always sucks for the team who, who lets the comeback happen is you wonder, well, what happened? It, it, it's like, did we just go ice cold? Did we, did we just stop playing? I mean, teams do that. You get comfortable when you have a lead. You, you're starting to kind of play around a little bit. You kind of start to, to kind of be like, well, we kind of already have this game in the bag. We don't really have to do too much. We just got to keep doing what we do and we'll be fine. But and then you try to do it and then you're like, you kind of start messing around. You start taking unnecessary shots, maybe trying to do some trick dunks. And then you notice the other team starts creeping back, and then you're just like, oh, we still got plenty of time, especially when you get late in the game. You're up 20 in the fourth. You think, oh, we just got to last. We just got to not let them outscore us by 20 points in the fourth quarter. We have this game. Thing is, is that they're going to, you can, like, NBA is such a fast big game, especially with the three point shot being so ever, uh, evolutionized by Steph Curry, where you hit three straight threes, three possessions. Now that leads cut to 11. That's a window, and then it, it, you can hit three straight threes on three straight possessions in one minute. And then now with 11 minutes left in the fourth quarter, you you only have an 11-point lead. And then they can come back, and then over a three-minute stretch, could hit four threes, and then after seven shots, and if you haven't scored a point, they have the lead. Like, it's, it's very quick. That's why I think leads are so interchangeable now. There's so many big leads blown because of the three-point shot. And I think it was shown again tonight. Also, the team plays some very good defense that also helps and contributes to the situation. And I think this is one of those things where the Mavericks, you know, you never want to loss like this, losing to a team in this fashion. But it's something you can learn from. It makes you realize, hey, if we ever get a lead, we got to play better next time because uh, we lost one. And we, we shouldn't have lost one, especially as late in the game as they did. You know, so it's, it's something that, you know, I think uh, Rick Carlisle is going to go on these guys about and get them guys right for the next game. But congratulations to the Toronto Raptors for having such a great comeback in their franchise history. And congratulations to Kyle Lowry for finally making a game, making an impact this year and, and really coming out. Because like I said, the Raptors have been like one of the best teams in the Eastern Conference this year without Kawhi Leonard. And it's all due to Nick Nurse and, 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 that, and that organization, that staff. Again, these guys ready to play and, and having a good system in place to continue to win without Kawhi, without that star player. But in other news, Luka Donich, who's currently sidelined with an ankle injury, is about to come to a deal with Jumpman. Now, Jumpman is associated and affiliated with Nike, which is, I mean, it, but it's kind of its own brand at the same time. Obviously, this is the most highest selling brand that Nike has, as Jordans still sell unbelievably today. Everybody still wants pairs of Jordans. It's been around since since the 80s and 90s, and, and everybody just wants Jordans, you know? And, and it, it is one of those things where, him signing with Jumpman is a big step. It kind of it kind of shows how he's viewed in, in in the eyes of advertisers, how big they think Luca is, how much of a money maker they think Luca is. I like to say Jumpman is like this. It's like let's like let's think about the three levels of a business, like just a made up business. You have your normal associates, you have your vice presidents and your co's, and like your maybe assistant managers, and then you have the third floor, which is your bosses and CEO. Jumpman is like the CEO in in Nike. Like they're the big brand. They're like the biggest that you can go, the highest you can go. And then you have Nike, which is just, you can be on the third floor, but you're just a boss. And they have a lot of people in Nike. Nike is considered one of the most popular brands in the entire uh, world. And they have a lot of, a lot of great players like, you know, LeBron's on Nike right now. Uh, you know, Kyrie Irving, he's he's part of Nike. Uh, KD's a part of Nike. Uh, they have some of the biggest stars in the NBA, but none of them are signed with Jumpman. That's why it's very big to me that Luka Doncic is about to sign with Jumpman. You know, not everybody has Jumpman. Like, think about it. The only team in college football, if you're going over there, who has Jumpman on their jersey is Michigan. No one else has Jumpman. It's just Nike or Adidas or Reebok or whatever. And it, it, it's it's big because I think that it shows that really Luca could be considered the next face of the NBA. Like Luca has taken the league by storm. He's an international star too because he's from overseas and he is one of the best players in the league today at in his second year. And I feel like this is a signal or a sign that people may view Luca as like the next face of the NBA and he's an overseas face. So not only is he's going to be so popular 
in the United States, he's going to be popular in his home country. He's going to be popular in other countries around the world. And I think that this is something that, you know, people wonder about when LeBron leaves. Who's going to be the next face of the NBA? Who is everybody going to think about NBA just know, okay, this player? Is it going to be KD? Is it, is it, is it going to be Giannis? Is it going to be Kawhi? You know, who, who is it going to be? Who's going to be that guy? Is it going to be Anthony Davis? And with, and with this, and with this move by Jumpman, Jordan, it, it, it might be answered. It might be Luca. Luca might be the guy, you know, just because this, this, this is a big deal for him, a big brand deal. Luca could be the next face of the NBA. And I have absolutely no problem if he is, you know, he, he is an incredible player. He is probably one of the most exciting players to watch on NBA television if you watch NBA games. And he does just, and he's, 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 he is going to be looked at, especially if the Dallas Mavericks ever win a championship with Luka as like the savior. Not even the savior, because it's not like they were saving him or anything. I mean, but the Dallas Mavericks were pretty mediocre. And they were, the torch was passed from Dirk to Luka, kind of. And I think that it's very interesting to me when I, when I listen to what people say about Luka around the league and just how much praise he gets. You know, people, a lot of people compare it to Trey Young right now because they're in the same draft class, and a lot of people wonder why the Atlanta Hawks did not keep Luka and went for Trey because Trey, at that time, we looked at as more of a box office hit than Luka because Luka was overseas, and it was like where people would people start coming to games to watch Luka Doncic, where Trey already had that, 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 that box office appeal, and people would come to the game to watch Trey because it's Trey. Now it's like the way Luka has played, now he's the box office appeal. Now he's the player you want to go see. It's it's like it's like Dallas when they come to your city, arenas can charge more tickets because it's just like you're coming to watch Luka Doncic play, so we can charge more because he's a big star. And so him signing with Jumpman, I feel like it's just confirming that. Now we'll have to see when that torch is actually gone, LeBron is actually gone, but Luka is definitely one of the most up and coming best players in the league. He could potentially be a top ten player in some people's eyes by the end of the year. And I think that that's something that's crazy because, again, this guy's an overseas player. You know, he learned his craft playing with grown men when he was 16 in adult Euro leagues. Like he 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 is almost like a like a, a overseas prodigy, you could say, you know, and that's something that has an appeal here, has appealed to jump, man, has appealed to Nike. And I think this is something that's really big for the league in general, too. You know, so for me, I think this is going to be something that will be definitely something to keep up with. Definitely going to see how they market him and see how they present him if he, if, if he does end up signing this deal with Jumpman and how it goes. And and, and and speaking of Luka and how he broke into the league and how things have gone, my next segment I'm going to talk about young players coming into the league from America and how they're the most athletic players in the league, but sometimes they lack that one skill that maybe overseas players like Luka don't lack when they come into the league because of the learning through high school and college or just through adult leagues coming through. So stay tuned for that. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Last segment, we talked about the Raptors coming back from 30 down and also about Luka Doncic signing with Jumpman and is he the new face of the league. And now to kind of continue on with that in a different transition is if you think about a lot of players in the game, like Luka, you know, he's an overseas player. What is one thing about overseas players that's usually known around basketball circles is that when you when you grow up overseas, when you learn overseas, 
you learn all the fundamentals of playing basketball. You know how to shoot regardless of position. You know just all the simple fundamentals, footwork, and all of that. So because a lot of overseas players are not considered the most athletic in the world, so how they beat you is with fundamentals. They beat you with positioning. They beat you with angles. Where a lot of American players, like players that came out like LeBron and Ben Simmons and Josh Smith over the years, they they were very talented at a young age. They were mainly better than everybody at a young age. And so they really used their athleticism all the way through high school or college, depending on if they win or not, to really be better than everybody. When it got to the league where everybody was kind of on your level or at least close to your level, they had to develop their game more to be even better or even greater over everybody else again. Where as Luka Doncic, you can tell he can get to the paint and he can shoot the three. Plus he's six eight six nine, so that definitely contributes to why he's such a hard guard. Where if you think about players that came into the league, like LeBron James, when he came into the league, he was an elite driver, dunker, finisher. But his jump shot was not really there. If he hit a jump shot, it was just because he was hot, but not because he really could just pull up any game and just make a jumper. Same thing with Josh Smith. Could not shoot the J come into the league, but he was great in the paint, great get finishing up in the rim. Same thing with Ben Simmons. You see that with Ben Simmons now, where Ben Simmons doesn't even take jump shots because he's not a great jump shooter. He just doesn't even take them. He's just like, well, I'm not a good jump shooter regardless, so I'm not going to shoot because I know that's a low percentage shot for my team. So if you think about that dynamic, why is this the cause? Why are American players not great shooters? Because literally you can sit here and think when they come into the league, they could already be very complete players if they learn how to shoot James. And LeBron can shoot a jump shot the way he shoots a jump shot now when he came in when he was 18. I mean, LeBron was great then, but LeBron might have been winning MVPs in his second year, third year in, 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 in the league. And, you know, Ben Simmons, the same way, he never really shot the J really at all. It's funny because I always say when you watch the pickup games, you'll see players that don't really take shots that are like uh, not considered good shots during the during the uh, year of the season. But take them in the pickup games that you see on Twitter and Instagram and they be making them all the time. And you're just like, why can't they do that in the game? And everything, even though we know a lot of pickup games, people don't play defense. But it's one of those things where a lot of people may look at the systems of which these players are, are grown up in. If you think about American players, they have, you know, rec league, they have church league, they have school league, and they have AAU. AAU is the top league in terms of basketball players. Because that's usually where every talented basketball player that we have through high school goes. And the thing about AAU and the criticism of AAU has always been, that they don't coach. It's just you're talented, you're talented, you're talented, just show your skills. It's almost like a showcase every game. It's just good players against other good players showcasing their talents. That's legitly all it is. They're not really coached. They're not really taught anything. It's just do what you do best. If you're going to improve, you got to improve on your own time. And you notice that because the because even Kobe said it uh, a few years ago. Kobe Bryant said it. He was like, the issue is, is that AAU, they don't coach. That's why a lot of players are coming into the league with a lack of, of a certain skill because, you know, if you're a great driver or you're a great finisher, you're going to do that all the way through high school and college. And then when the league gets here, you're like, okay, I need to get a jump shot. You know, like that's legitimately how it is. Like you literally sit there and it's just like, okay, well, now I need to. Why is there not a sense of urgency at a younger age to get, though, at least to have a decent jump shot, or at least to have a respectable skill. Like maybe, like maybe your, 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 your vision of the court wasn't the best because a lot of the time when you drive to the paint, you're kind of like just one, like a one track, uh, mine, a one uh, tunnel vision to the paint where now you can learn how to see the court more. Now when you're driving, you can pass it out, make plays and become more of a playmaker. It's things like that. I feel like in the Euro leagues and in overseas leagues, they teach you. They teach you how those things. Because again, like I said, it, it, the fact is that a lot of overseas players are not as athletic, so they have to know how to do other things to be successful. Which is when when they get to the league, well, we I can I may not be more faster than you, I may not be stronger than you, I may not be able to jump higher than you, but I I I, I have fundamentals. I have things that you have maybe not worked on. So when it comes to my fundamentals, can share defense. Or and vice versa. I know how to guard you, or I know how to score against you. That's why Luka Doncic said it's easier to score in the league. Because remember, he's playing in the Euro League against grown men at 16 who have been taught the same things he's been taught, so he they know the tricks of the trade. Where NBA, that's not necessarily the case. 
the players here weren't necessarily taught that. So that's why, that's why when he plays against them, he knows I can get away with this. I can do this to him because they're not taught this. They know they're not, they're not technically trained to guard this. So they know how to get plays against them in all, in all situations and all plan, uh, all facets of the game. That's why players like Luca and Dirk and Manu Ginobili over the last few years are considered one of the best players from overseas because they've learned those things. And it's great because you have to think about it. Like, literally an American, if you're a big man, you're not really taught to shoot the three. You're really just taught to rebound, post, you know, uh, block shots. They're, they're teaching you a lot of big man stuff. But nobody really tries to go out of the way to shoot the three ball, which I think you should. I feel like since the league is changing now to a three-point shooting game where big men can now shoot threes, I feel like that there is a more increased, there's more of an increased urgency now at the younger levels to get players that are supposed to be big men going up to shoot the ball. You know, but the problem is sometimes is that sometimes big men don't usually always have the best stroke in the world. And, you know, they got to really learn how to shoot from a distance where they're so used to just being like seven foot and just being underneath the rim and laying it up. Because we're looking at percentages. If you're seven foot and you're underneath the rim, that's a much higher percentage of a shot than if you come from the three point line and you're seven foot. That's why as a big man, you got to shoot very few per game, but make sure you make a few of them to make it respectable where it makes you more of a complete player. That's why players, big men today, like DeMarcus Cousins, he can step out and shoot the three. You know, um, he's, 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 he's a guy who, especially before his, a lot of his leg injuries or lower, lower, um, body injuries, he, he, with that three ball, DeMarcus Cousins was one of the most unstoppable centers in the league. That's why Anthony Davis is such an unstoppable player. He can beat you in the mid range. He can beat you from three, and he can beat you in the paint. And he's also one of the most athletic players, so he can get past you if you have a very slow big man on you. He can take you to the three point line and go right past you. And and I think that's where the league is changing. Obviously, we we, we credit that to Steph Curry because the three point shot has now became as valuable as it's ever been in NBA history, and and it's probably gonna be like this for a while because again, three is more than two, so why not take the three than the two? And the reason why I bring this up is I just feel like that's something that that is very accurate and very it's very real in today's basketball, you know, journey for everybody growing up trying to get into the league. And that's why I think when they talk about trying to play overseas, it's not a bad idea to maybe send your your kid who just came out of high school and send him overseas instead of college. Because even in college, yes, you're coached, but it depends because if you're one and done, you 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 get coached, but it's coached to a certain extent because you're like I'm one and done. I'm not going to be here forever, so you may not take it as seriously. It just depends on the work effort of that player. Where if you know you're going to be at college for three to four years, you're taking as much coaching as you can because you're trying to be better. You're trying to be better than what you were freshman year when you're a senior. You want to be more of a complete player your senior year of college than you were your freshman year of college. That's why they have this case of why don't you go overseas. Because not only are you playing against grown men who know all the fundamentals and tricks, you can learn that through playing with them, plus the coaching of the coaching over there. So then when you come to the league, you, we can sit here and actually say, you're better prepared now from playing overseas, even if it was only for one or two years, than maybe a college basketball player was playing at all four years at a university. Like, really, that's something that you can legitimately make. I mean, players have done this route. You know, Brandon Jennings was one of the most famous cases. He went overseas. He forego the college because he felt like he wasn't going to get what he needed from college. You know, and he went overseas to play for you. You know, they tried to do that with Lamelo Ball. They tried to send him overseas, and he played over in the overseas league. And and I think that was a good experience for him. That's why I feel like now that he's in this new league, I feel like he's going to be a top five pick because of that experiences that he's had. It wasn't the greatest experience overall in terms of the brand. But overall, it really helped the Miller Ball, I believe. I believe it helped with him and doing everything like that. So those are things that really I've seen from players coming into the league that are young and players coming from overseas like Luca and Dirk and things like that. So coming up next, we're going to switch to college basketball. We're going to talk about the new AP25 poll that just dropped. And also we're going to talk about some upsets that happened in college basketball this past weekend. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. 
now. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Bryce Lewis, and last topic, we talked about uh, how the league has changed where players from overseas come into the league, being able to shoot the three ball and all the fundamentals like Luka Doncic and Dirk, where American players like LeBron, Ben Simmons, and Josh Miller as examples have came into the league being tremendous at finishing, but lack other skills like being able to shoot the basketball and why that is and why it's, it's, it's through the systems that they grew up in in terms of playing basketball where they played America sports and Mary, maybe American coaching like AAU doesn't have the same type of coaching as overseas. But now we're going to switch it to some college basketball talk. We're going to talk about the AP25 poll that dropped and we're going to talk about uh, some of the upsets also that happened in college basketball this past weekend. Zaga is the new number one. They are the number one team in the nation. Zaga is always a good team every year. They're usually a team every year that plays a very, very good game. Um, they're usually a team that is going to probably be a top four seed. I mean, honestly, at this rate, if they play at this rate, they'll be a top number one seed in the tournament. Maybe the number one overall seed, depending on how it ends up. Uh, number two, Ohio State. Ohio State, obviously, coming off that loss to Minnesota about a week ago, have came back, played good basketball, and now they're back up to number two. Louisville, uh, Louis, they lost, remember, they lost Texas Tech, which made them drop from number one. And now they're number that game and came back up to number three. Duke, obviously remember their loss uh, earlier in the season to Stephen F. Austin and now a game-winning buzzer beater. Uh, Duke, Duke's number four. Kansas, they were the latest number one team to lose. They lost, and now they're number five in the AP poll. Uh, still a top five team, but, you know, that was that was, that was a big loss for Kansas. Uh, number six is Oregon. Oregon has really rise up the ranks. Oregon has played, a great, has played great this year. They're one of the best teams in the Pac-12 in basketball. Uh, and they, I mean, they are currently ranked as the highest rated Pac-12 team in basketball right now also. So, uh, great for Oregon. Uh, number seven is Baylor. Uh, Baylor, uh, is the second highest ranked Big 12 team. And, uh, they, uh, have played also a great year. You know, I, I, I love, uh, Baylor's uniforms and they're, and they're, they're very interesting. If you've ever seen a Baylor game and you've seen their basketball court, it's very interesting. Number eight, Auburn. Auburn, usually always a good team. It's been a couple, it's been funny because the last couple of years, Auburn's really been a good basketball team. And in, in, in sports and 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 in college basketball, and they've really played uh, well, which is why they were, they are in this number eight spot. Number nine is Memphis. Memphis, obviously, Memphis is coming back, having a great year this year. Uh, the number nine now, they're getting in the top ten, and they continue on this stretch. You can maybe be crack the top five and maybe compete for a two seed potentially in the tournament if they continue at this rate. Uh, number ten, Villanova. Villanova was also upset this past weekend. Uh, they 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 usually are they're gonna be bad. They're usually a good basketball power. They're usually good every year. Uh, I have no worries about Villanova, so you know they'll be back. Michigan's number eleven. Uh, Michigan, you know they've had some some losses here and there, but they've bounced back. They're playing pretty good basketball right now. Uh, Warren Howard's gonna get those boys ready for the next couple of weeks because we're about to after I think the last couple of games we're about to start getting conference play in college basketball. So that's obviously a big, big uh, time in college basketball. And number twelve is Butler. Butler, uh, obviously another good team, another team that uh was looking just uh improve their their improve their status and, and get up there. And uh, just uh, improve as a team. Thirteen is Maryland. You know, they're a team that I feel like also could make a run in the NCAA tournament. In my personal opinion. Uh, number fourteen, Michigan State. Number fifteen, San Diego State. Sixteen, Virginia, the defending national champions, were also upset this past week, and that's why they dropped all the way to sixteen. This was the first home loss they've had also in a very, very, very long time. So that was a big, big loss for Virginia. Florida State. Is coming in at 17. They they played well. They've cracked themselves to the top 25. They're moving up in the ranks slowly. So it's, it's going to be pretty pretty impressive. 
Um, you know, Dayton also lost this week. Um, and another great game. I think that was a buzzer beater they lost. Um, Dalton, Dal- Dayton, you know, and, and, you know, these, these, these shows you how crazy college basketball really is with all the upsets that we've had and saw and dealt with. And Dayton's never 18, 19 in Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky also lost. As you can tell, a lot of these teams lost. That's why they're so regular. Because you don't really hear Kentucky ever being 19th in the nation, but that's why they're 19. Only Penn State, 21st, Washington, 22nd, West Virginia, 23rd, Texas Tech, 24th, Arizona. Now we're going to talk about some of the major upsets that happened this past week in college basketball, starting with Seton Hall upsetting number seven, Maryland. Maryland uh, was upset by Seton Hall, 52-48. to 48. Uh, It was a great game, very low scoring game, very defensive game, as you can tell, which is usually how sometimes how you have to play these games. You have to play very defensive. It's a very defensive game. Um, Seton Hall, congratulations to those guys. Uh, they got picked up. They put they paid up a great dub. Um, you know, they really outplayed Maryland in the first half. Uh, they won the first half, twenty-seven to eighteen. So they really played outplayed. They, they shut them out defensively. And then we're going to talk about another upset: St. John's beat Arizona, seventy to sixty-seven. Uh, this game again. If you notice about these games in the first half, St. John's jumped on Wildcats early, forty to twenty-six, and Arizona had to make a late comeback to try to win. But they were able to come out and win. Uh, the St. John's is 11 and two on the year. I would not be shocked if they cracked the 25 hole next week because they've won a lot of good games. And this is a big win for them coming into this meeting Arizona at Arizona, especially this was a very big win for them. And congratulations to those guys, Colorado and Dayton, Colorado beat Dayton on a game winning shot in overtime, 78, 76. Uh, this was a great game. One of the most, probably one of the most fantastic games. They this is a win that Colorado basically needed and and they haven't had in the past and this is big for them because it, it makes Colorado the way they start the season kind of look bound as long as they don't fall off they look bound to make the NCAA tournament they look bound to to be able to win and be able to make the tournament and basically be successful in everything they do uh it was like one of the best teams again out there in the nation, and they deserve everything that they've gotten because they've played very well for their team. They're 10-2 ten, ten and two this year, so congrats to the Colorado Buffs. Kentucky and Ohio State, not really an upset, but a great game. Five versus six. Ohio State won that one, 71-65. Uh, both teams played a great game. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, the Buckeyes, they're, they're obviously competing for a number one, probably a number two if they don't get number one seed in the tournament. Wildcats have three losses so far this year against some good opponents. Uh, Kentucky has shown some, some some flaws and some holes in their team, so that's something to look out for. Because uh, I, I, it makes me kind of be like, maybe don't be surprised if they make it far in the tournament if something that maybe upset happens or anything like that. Because you do have, see some holes in the team a little bit that makes you a little bit worried about them. Um, Villanova beat Kansas. They were the team that upset at number one Kansas this past week. Uh, one point game. It was a great game. Like, this game was very close from the get-go. You can tell these teams are very, very evenly matched. Uh, both of these games, this was, like, a very defensive game also, especially in the first half. Obviously, scoring picked up in the second half, but you can tell both teams are coming out here, and um, they played well, and Villanova got the upset. And this is why Villanova's a team every year that they're dangerous because they, they, they are just as good as any of these top teams. Remember, they were defending national championships a couple of years ago. Do not sleep on these guys. These guys can play with the best of them they can play with the top teams in the in, in the country and and they're a team to be reckoned with when tournament time comes around for sure trust me on that Villanova is not a team to be reckoned with and the biggest upset of the weekend in a lot of people's eyes some of what people feel like is when Virginia lost to South Carolina at home uh 70 to 59 uh the Gamecocks came out blitzing the Cavaliers and the Cavaliers are just weren't able to recover um South Carolina really played well this is the big game for South Carolina Eight and four now, beating a number nine team. This again, this is another great resume boosting win for them. This is a great win that they have moving forward. And I feel like this is this is a this is a game where, you know, it it, it makes you interesting because it makes you think. Okay, is there some things that are wrong with Virginia? Is Virginia like they can be able to defend their title? You know, you lose these guys against South Carolina. South Carolina's not a bad team. Their team is going to be playoffs for a tournament spot, which I think. 
if they continue the stretch and they do real SEC play and get a couple more key wins, they'll probably get in. But, you know, Virginia you know, has to bounce back. They have to come back from this and rebound. Because, you know, things like this happen. Things like this happen in, in, in college basketball. Upsets are very important. I just named four or five upsets just now. Uh, these these games are very um, – it's very telling. It's, it really just reminds you of how the tournament is going to be in March. Any team can upset anybody. All it takes is someone having a great performance from one player's team, and then boom, they lose. So, uh, you know, that, 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 that's that. And coming up next, I'm going to give my predictions and my thoughts on the Christmas Day games coming right up. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Now we're going to talk about the NBA Christmas games, my thoughts on each game, and my predictions on those games. Last segment, we were talking about college basketball upsets and the new AP 25 ranking that just came out. So now we're going to get into some NBA talk again, as I said. And the first game on the Christmas slate is Celtics and Raptors. Uh, Celtics and Raptors are two teams, top teams in the Eastern Conference. Both teams are playing exceptional basketball right now. Uh, Kemba Walker has been such a grace for the Boston Celtics, an easy transition, easy smooth in transition for the Boston Celtics as they're playing the defending champion Toronto Raptors with Piazza Siakam, one of the best players, probably in potential to win another most improved player, Kyle Lowry and, and those boys, Serge Baca, Serge Blaha, you know, and, you know, it's a pretty, it's, it's going to be a great game. It starts, it starts to slate at 12. Uh, I think this is a great game to go. Uh, to start with this, I think this game's going to show this could potentially be a future playoff matchup, potentially, depending on what happens in the Eastern Conference. Uh, two teams that people look at as the second tier behind Philadelphia and Milwaukee. I think that both of these teams could cause both of those teams trouble and maybe uh, present an upset potentially in those games. Um, both teams are coming into here with, like I said, top, top five seeds in the Eastern Conference. Um, key matchup for me in this game, X Factor matchup is the point guard matchup, Kimball Walker versus Lowry slash Van Fleet. Uh, it's going to be very important to see what happens. I feel like you know what's going to happen with Jalen Brown and, and, and Tatum and Siakam and Ibaka and everybody else, OG Ananobi. I think that this game is going to come down to just who, I mean, you have two of the best coaches in the game. I mean, you have Brad Stevens, one of the best young coaches in the game. You have Nick Nurse, one of the best coaches in the game, uh, already in the second year uh, coaching Toronto. And this is going to be one of those games where it's going to show, you know, who who is who is the best in in the second tier that people consider Toronto and the Celtics to be in. This game is going to come down to just like game execution. I think this is going to be a great game to start your Christmas. You know, you just open up the gifts at noon. It's be a great game to turn on when you're watching uh, when you're when you open up the gifts on Christmas Day. So that's that's the first game. Second game. The Bucks and the 76ers, obviously, a lot of people consider this an Eastern Conference Finals matchup. They consider this the series that will determine who goes to the NBA Finals. Uh, both teams coming in here hot. Uh, Giannis got got a very big victory over the Lakers this, this last week against LeBron. And the 76ers are also playing some great basketball right now. Um, it's going to be an interesting matchup, again, with the Greek Freak and you know Ben Simmons and Embiid. You know, it's like there's some star power in this game. Again, another great second game to start off because I mean, when you look at the when you look at the games, you're looking at it from the Eastern Conference and the Western Conference. Perspective, you may make the argument outside the Lakers Clippers, the Eastern Conference has the best slate of games on this day, on Christmas Day. And I expect this game to be a very physical game. I expect this game to be a very grimy game. Uh, both teams play a terrific, uh, terrific defense. You know, they're both known for defense. 
and they're also very good offensively at the same time. It'll be interesting to see that matchup with Embiid and, and, and whoever they put on him, like the Lopez brothers from the Bucks. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens just from everybody's perspective. Just it, It's going to be interesting because this is kind of a preview of what we could see in the playoffs. I want to see what Ben Simmons does here. He's my X factor because if you're going to beat Milwaukee, Ben Simmons can't give you five-point games. Ben Simmons got to at least get you about 15, at least 15, 15 to 16 every time they play if they're going to have a chance to beat the Milwaukee Bucks in the playoffs. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens in this game. It'll be interesting to see because, you know, Giannis will be guarding Ben Simmons from time to time in this game. Or sometimes, you know, Ben Simmons is like a very, very big matchup. They both kind of are almost like a point forward, even though we consider Ben Simmons more of a natural point guard. But that's going to be the big matchup in the game. Uh, I'm going to go with the – I'm going to go with the, with the Bucks here. I think the Bucks are going to beat the 76ers in this game. I think the Bucks are going to come out with a victory. And also in my last game, I didn't give my prediction. I'm going with Toronto to win that game. So those are my two predictions so far on the Christmas Day games. And the next Christmas Day game is Rockets and Warriors. Now, when I saw this game, I know the NBA was probably furious that they had to play the Warriors on Christmas Day now because the Warriors are not a great team this year. And it's just like this probably will be, in their mind, maybe one of the lowest rated games on Christmas Day because it's just like, well, I mean, unless you just really love James Harden and Russell Westbrook, that, that's that's really it. You don't I mean, because the, the, the Warriors don't really have any other star stars that you come to see on their play game on their team right now. And um, I think that, you know, it happens. You never know. Like I say when you make these matchups, you don't expect a team to be bad by this time. It's just one of those things where it just happens to be that way. But you never expect it. And I think that's why they're kind of like, dang, we really have to put Houston and the Warriors midday on a national televised game. You know, but you never know. These are, these are the type of games that I always say low key can be good. The Andrew Russell does some things, uh, and, you know, Draymond Green and Eric Pastel play well. This game could be competitive, and it could be one of those games, again, maybe not a lot of people may go out of their way to watch it, but it could be one of the better games. It's not going to be as bad as you think it's going to be. Now, I'm saying that I'm still going to take Houston, Houston to win this game, but I'm just saying don't don't think the game will be bad already just because of who's playing in the game. You got to look at it and think about it from a perspective of, you know, could there be an upset? The intrigue unit being intrigued by a potential upset by the Golden State Warriors, who who right now, again, with the injuries to Curry and everybody are just going through a little slouch, little slouch right now. And now the big game, the biggest game of the day in a lot of people's mind, 8 o'clock on ABC, big stage, biggest stage. You know, it's interesting that Rockets' uh, Warrior game can be looked at as like the appetizer to the big game. Clippers and Lakers. Obviously, last time the Clippers and Lakers played, Clippers won opening night. Uh, that was a game where LeBron didn't have his best game, so a lot of people were questioning, is LeBron still the king? Is he still able to play at a high level? Is, and, and, he's, and he's came back and he's responded astounding, saying that I am still here. I'm not a washed king. Now, LeBron was out against Denver on Monday. I think he'll be back for this game on Wednesday. I think he's not going to miss it. I truly believe he's not going to miss it. Um, so I think everybody's going to be at full strength coming into this game. And this is a game that a lot of people look forward to. The, I, I would not be surprised if every time the Lakers and Clippers play, it's always the highest rated game on those days in terms of just, and maybe, and maybe in the season. I think out of the top 10 highest rated games, I think that all four of the Lakers Clipper games are going to be in the top 10. Especially on Christmas Day, you know where everybody's at their house. If you're a basketball fan, you know they're coming on. 8 o'clock, this is like after all the gifts have been open. This is when you're maybe family trying to just settling down. Oh, man, you Clippers and, and you got Clippers and Lakers to end the night. Oh, man, I know that's going to be a basketball um, a basketball fan's dream. And I think that this game is going to come down to the same thing that came out for this game. Who's going to play the best defense? Lakers are looking like a better team than they did the first game. And the Clippers have looked here and there. Now, we don't, I mean, first game, you can tell both teams took it seriously. Now, I think they're going to take this game seriously also again. So I think this is going to be a game that comes down to defense. Both teams are very great defensively. Uh, both teams have stars. I think the stars are going to shine. A lot of people want to see that matchup with, since Paul George is here now, that Kawhi Paul George matchup, which is LeBron and AD. And it's going to be interesting what happens in there. I think that this is probably, again, going to be one of the highest rated games of the season. And I'm going to go with the Lakers. I think the Lakers are going to get their win back. I think they're going to go and beat the Clippers in this game. I think that it's always interesting because they play in the exact same arena. 
So regardless of the particularly the Clippers or Lakers are the home team, I mean whoever fan base show up is is the home team basically because they're playing in the exact same arena. But I'm gonna go with the Lakers. I think they're gonna come back and get their win back, and we're gonna go into the, the season series one one going into the third game coming up after New Year's. And now the last game, uh, Nuggets and Pelicans probably the least. I mean outside of Rockets and Warriors, maybe the least anticipated game. Also the latest game on ESPN. Um. I'm, I'm gonna go with Denver here. Um, you know the Pelicans, they have some guys. They just they just don't play great, great defense. And I think the Pelicans um, season, they're just kind of trying to get their young guys out there and play. Obviously, you know this past week they made Lonzo Ball available, so we'll have to see what happens there. And um, you know I think the Nuggets are playing pretty well. They're playing some good basketball right now. They just beat the Lakers, even without Le- without LeBron, but they just beat the Lakers 128 to 104 and. I think the Nuggets are playing some great basketball right now. They're a team that is trying to remind the league, hey, don't forget about us. Don't forget we exist. We're still here. We're still, we still feel like we are a top team in the Western Conference and you shouldn't sleep on us. And we we'll, we may make it get an upset here and there to make you pay attention to us. So definitely, definitely, I think the Nuggets are going to win this game. But I think that this is also a good game for Ingram and them. So, you know, play well, you know, just, and just show everybody what, what, what they can do. Because the Pelicans are just looking at this now as more of a redeeming yourself type of season, you know. So, and, and, and that's all I got for you today. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask you to please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Network from movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.